Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Maskera say magadi. Welcome, karibu sana to Clara's book launch. I am not going to talk much because um, I believe that uh, the book has so much to tell us uh, from the readings that we're going to, to get into. Um, my name is Moses Billy. I'm a spoken word artist, uh, a writer, a creative enterprise consultant, and a foodie. I also love traveling, and I speak five languages. I speak Shona, English, a bit of Nepali, a bit of Portuguese, and a lot of poetry. So, these lovely ladies I have right here with me tonight, um, I'm going to attempt to introduce them, but I think it will be best if they introduce themselves. Uh, so, uh, to my... Where do I start? Okay, where do I start? Stage right or left? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll start with Charmaine. As you've heard, stage right, stage left, she's into theatre. And um, those of you who have witnessed her on stage, wow, that's, uh, she does magic on stage. And she's also been part of the camera, she's been into film, and uh, she's, part of, she's been part of award winning uh, projects actually. But I think uh, you may. No, 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 that, that's enough. Like, <laughs> since you are humble, he spoke it in another language. Poetry would come. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Clara, what about you? Yeah, I'm going to be Clara. All right, and we have Clara here. Um, she plays the violin, she plays the lira, she loves languages. Uh, she speaks Shona better than some Zimbabweans I know who were born and raised in Zimbabwe. <laughs> and she's an amazing person. She has written a book which we are gathered here uh, for uh, tonight. And I think um, I don't want to say much, maybe if you may add some more on, onto that. Onto that? Yeah. Um, yes, I wanted to say. Uh, Magadi, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, we have a wonderful crowd here today. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, thank you so much for honoring this um, this book launch. Um, and thank you so much, Charmaine. Thank you so much, Morset. Uh, I'm very honored. Um, so I'm honored by both of these people coming here to read uh, some of these words also and to be part of this discussion. Uh, they are two artists whose voices, um, whose being I deeply respect. Uh, and oh. um, no, it's true. You know? It's very true. Uh, anytime these two are doing anything, you should go, you should witness, you should engage. Yeah. Uh, so uh, to have them both um, respect my work in this way uh, just feels like a huge blessing and a huge honor uh, because this book has been a very long time coming. Uh, this is uh, probably about 10 years of my life <laughs> is in this book. Um, it, of course it does go, the first play that is included in the book is um, it wasn't officially a ceremony theater play uh, it was it, yeah, it was more of a break out of theater play. It was performed at Yale University when I was there. I didn't know that I was doing ceremony at the time. Um, ceremony was still, as a concept, as a conscious concept, uh, it was not that familiar. As a sole concept, it's been what I've been doing my entire life. So, um, so then moving into all of these different plays, last year I just, I had a feeling that um, I keep on doing things and I wanted to compile it all into one book, into one magical book that could say, um, on some level in a sentence, uh, we need to tell stories to the spirits, just as much as they need to tell stories to us. Uh, and uh, this is a need. This is not a game. 
This is not a play. This is not a pretend, oh, I will pretend to be a tree or whatever, and it's an interesting exercise. This is a real deep human need for our earth uh, and for us to rebalance and harmonize all of our relationships. Um, so there are many different plays in here, and we are going to be hearing excerpts from those plays. Today, each play came essentially as a story that was given to me um, by the spirits, in a, usually in a particular place, but the star ceremony was by the stars, so that one was tricky when it came to location. Um, and the reason why stories were given was because um, it's the, the classic call and response. It's because they wanted to be given back. Um, the mountain did not give me a story so that I would go and just tell the story of the mountain. The mountain wanted to hear itself in my perception of the story, my human perception of the story that was given to me. Uh, and these are very deep ceremonies. Um, these are very deep ceremony practices. Um, they're not actually techniques because they're a form of creative communication between all the worlds. Um, and uh, so I compiled this. Uh, I wrote an introduction. Um, the introduction has actually been translated back from the Polish into English uh, because the first edition of this book that was launched was the Polish edition. Um, which I'm actually very pleased to say is being taken seriously in Poland uh, by the, the, the theater community there, and I'm, I'm really excited about that. Uh, I'm really excited about that because I feel like, again, it's something that all of us human beings now, in some way, we need to wake up to. Um, so that's my perception of the ideas of the book. Of course, I wrote it, so you know how it is. So uh, maybe what we'll do is, I'm going to open our gathering today with a song. And, uh, and songs are a huge theme in the book. Uh, and then uh, the wonderful Charmaine is going to read a few fragments from the introduction that are going to also uh, talk about the, the ideas of the book.
The theater of the word is gone. Image has killed word forever. This challenging statement was made by a great actor who unfortunately is no longer with us in this side of reality and who wisely and truthfully chose not only words but also an elegant way of weaving them together. The meaning of a sentence, phrase, paragraph, page, scene, an entire play. The word builds on the whole and the whole is contained in one word. This actor had been observing the word for many years and the borders that separated the art from the word, from the art of the image after the advent of television and screens had cut his life into two like a cruel wall. How well we know these cruel walls and boundaries. I have no doubt that he knew what he was talking about. Poetry indeed is no longer what it was before the age of the screens. However, that doesn't mean that the word has lost its meaning or magic. Just because people are less concerned with the word now does not mean that the word is less valuable. On the contrary, combining words with images is an art. The most developed and wise version of which we see in ancient Egypt Hieroglyphics are a perfect combination of sound and symbolic image. The ancient Egyptians, the Maya, the Dogon, and later after them, from them, the Greeks, believed that the word was not an invention of mankind, but a gift from the gods. My own people, Slavic people, a people who called themselves Slavic, meaning the people of the praising word. The word came as a gift from the stars along with the civilization and temple building. It is a gift to mankind from the great ancestors. In Egypt, Neturu meaning elements or gods, who came from heaven to teach people how to be beautifully and nobly human. They gave us the word whose essence is magic, that is creativity. The word creates, the word rings, the word shapes, the word flies around in the world on wings of voice using the sound which is the essence of the human soul is heard. The word does not lose its magic just because people do not use it or use it less ambitious, ambitiously than our ancestors at the temples of Egypt. In Globeki Tepe, temples in Turkey or in the shrine of the great Zimbabwe, the word may be lying in the corner like a pair of dusty inline skates waiting for their owner or like that very interesting looking book that no one has bothered to read yet. The word left to its own devices never loses its essence. It does not become less itself. It simply lives on in a more limited relationship with people. And the voice that we know we are no longer able to hear still resounds and sings a song that also keeps us those who cannot hear alive. And uh, before we go on move into the discussion, can you read the other excerpt from the introduction? So we just have a sense of the um, from the shamans of theater. Yeah. The storyteller was a shaman of the word, someone who carried an entire epic history inside of her. She did not learn one character only, she had to tame the inhuman spirit of the myth and not always tell it from a human perspective. She spoke best when the myth came out in different levels, 
so that it meant one thing for the ancestors and another for the people and yet another thing for other people. Myth is like a cake. It has many layers and they're all delicious but not all of them are for everyone and certainly for everyone at the same time because every human being, every society even has many various times. Therefore the storyteller was wise, not with human wisdom but with magical wisdom. She limped close to the ground and crossed bridges of stars simultaneously. The storyteller was not was not there to attract bored people who would soon go away, forget, scatter, and look for another drug to stifle the sadness and pain of their existence. The storyteller was there to speak with words and voice so beautifully, so as to reconcile the visible and invisible words with her tale. And as we can see, fairy tales are not dying out. People have stopped listening built closed boxed theatres became fascinated by conflict, rational philosophy, trauma, and how we can argue in an interesting way using only dialogue and pause. They started making films where little is said and a lot is shot. They adapted Greek myths instead of Egyptian philosophy, and they claimed that they now know how to tell stories. Well, if you buy the book, you'll get to hear what comes next. <laughs> uh, when, you're not, when you don't have to be selling your own book. <laughs> um, yeah, so I suppose, um, you know, with the introduction, there's that sense of um, what is ceremony theater? Can I pick up somebody? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't feel stressed. Yeah. Don't, yeah. What, what was the question? Mm -hmm. I know it, it's, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. We'll leave you till the, there's the Q&A at the, at the end. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, it's a, um, it's, it's the question that's being addressed by the book, by the introduction, by that, um, the sense of, you know, of course, uh, whether we call it ceremony theater, we call it ritual theater. For me, um, my use of English is very good and also very intuitive. Um, I don't know why, to be honest. Uh, English is my second language. Um, when I say intuitive, it's that nobody has yet been able to convince me that calling it ritual theater is better than calling it ceremony theater. My, my gut sense is that ceremony is collective and that ritual is personal. When I think about ceremony, I think of a collective of rituals, you know, private rituals that then prepare a public ceremony. So that's why, despite um, you know, numerous people uh, sending me all kinds of Oxford dictionary definitions, <laughs> I just, something in me says no. What I do, if I'm going to use the English word, I'm going to say ceremony theater uh, for those reasons. Um, and on some level, it's also understanding a big, a big part of my understanding of what I do um, is uh, was the discovery of Egypt, Kemet, the the temples, um, because also again these things are intuitive. Um, I I was I was not convinced that uh, you know the way that you learned theater, the way that I learned theater. It was very Greek-oriented, uh, Greek philosophy, Greek plays, so much drama, so much trauma, um, and you know, and the question was for what? So, um, so at some point, I just burned out on the whole thing. I said, no, you know, if if, if Western theater is based on the Greeks, if it's based on how well people can kill and rape each other and talk about their problems. I'm really not interested. That's not really how I want to read. Sorry. It was comedy. Yes, yes, there was, definitely, yeah. But it's more this idea that we have or that we've been in, when we talk about Western philosophy, that we've cut our own route, um, you know, because we have cut Egypt out of the picture somehow. 
Uh, of course, Egypt is this, it, it, it's as great of a mystery um, in terms of the history of it as uh, Great Zimbabwe, for example, uh, and also the connection between the two. So when we talk about Egypt, we are also talking about Africa, and we are also talking about uh, the spiritual approach towards ceremony and storytelling, right? So the Greeks learned from the Egyptians. Uh, yes, and I was never told that when I was a kid. Um, and there was just this intuitive sense that somehow um, there was a, a diminishing of something that was trying to come through. And so when we look at those Egyptian temples and we look at um, who were actors and actresses, they were priests and priestesses. So the initiations that we see that happen, you know, of course for shamans or for medicine people, or even when you look at West Africa and you look at the great ancestors, the Orisha, who also live in South America, Central America, and kind of, they're all over. I mean, the Orisha clearly love to travel. Not all ancestors do, but the Orisha do. Um, those initiations are storytelling, theater initiations, and they're spiritual initiations at the same time. And then you see a whole theater tradition, and, and I'm speaking also from the Polish tradition, the Slavic tradition, uh, that was uh, where you have the theater training, but you don't have the spiritual initiation, and what comes out is the trauma that is trying to heal itself. Um, so that's one thing. That's, there's a lot about that in the introduction. But the other part about it is... Um, like I was saying, it's that sense, uh, you know, since a long time ago, actually, I, I don't know. Yeah, a long time ago. Again, a lot of my work is, is intuitive and I understand it later. Uh, my understanding of how do we take the invisible world seriously? How do we actually connect? How do we talk? Um, how do we do so honestly and creatively? How do we bring the human creative capacity back into ceremony. Because ceremony around the world has become very functional. It's become, we do this, we do it like this, it's always like this, and the rest, um, you know, uh, if you do anything different, then beware, because there will be consequences, you know? But ceremony is not you know, of course, there are many types of ceremonies, there are many types of rituals, but the communication, the bridge building between the worlds that involves us actually being able to hear each other's stories and voices, um, and that also involves giving to the non-human world the same storytelling capacity that, <coughs> philosophically speaking, our, the overculture, the Western overculture, has been claiming only for themselves. The human being is a storytelling animal. Everyone else is just eating and shitting, right? Or something. <laughs> um, but it's, it's not true. The storytelling capacity was gifted to us. And it was gifted to us precisely because we are actually young in the storytelling capacity. We are young in our understanding of the power of it uh, and, and the, the way that it connects and, and what it does. And by being gifted with the storytelling capacity, the storytelling capacity always comes with the story listening capacity. It's the natural, I mean, we see it here, the call and response, call and response, call and response. Everything in life is a call and response. Cause, effect, action, reaction, on, in all the worlds, you know? And in storytelling, you have the same thing. So, um, so that to me is, uh, is, is what, we are, what we are talking about, yeah. So I don't know if you have any comments or ideas or, yeah, as people not, of the word. Not, <laughs> not right now. Okay. Towards the end. When everybody else has warmed up. Ah. You know, like, you know, still trying to say, where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> so shall we continue with the, yes. with the reading? Okay, so... I find it very interesting because um, we've had three votes today for a song of the sacred mountain. Um, so we're going to be reading a lot of excerpts from the play Song of the Sacred Mountain. Um, a lot of the songs. I'm sorry, I'm going to turn on a backup recorder. I'm not completely sure I trust those batteries. Um, yes. Yeah, so I'm going to be doodling 
sound-wise, and uh, these two wonderful people are going to tell us the story of the mountain. The story of the mountain is, uh, it is, uh, uh, this is, yeah, mainly the, so the story of the mountain is the story of um, Zimbabwean mountains, yeah, so this came from several different mountains in Zimbabwe, and uh, this is the story that was channeled. A human being is easy to manipulate, you understand. A person can be starved, for example. Starving so that he only thinks about food. This man drags himself all day, his head down, looking for something to eat. Eyes glued to the ground as if the dust held his eyes in a short leash. What's there? Maybe chibage, maybe some grain, maybe a piece of bread, a relic of another person's hunger, maybe a coin. The hungry man stares at the ground and does not let it go. Huge hairy paws emerge from his eyes with long greedy nails. They cling to the soil. They will not let go. The earth will give him what he needs. This is what the man believes. The hungry man will not look at the stars, wonder about the meaning of life. He will not dream. Heaven offers nothing to the hungry. And after all, the hungry man will be too weak after some time to keep his head up. No, you have to look at earth. The head is heavy with difficult thoughts about children, for example, also hungry about family. A thought, if today you do not find something to eat tomorrow, the search will be even more difficult, even dangerous. Everywhere and always, manipulation of a human being is based on this. When the hungry man or woman thinks only of food, it is dangerous. Because they see and hear and feel and smell only food, they will stop seeing people, the shops, the law, the police, prison, life, tomorrow. They see only food. Suddenly the hungry man realized he was crazy to ever be hungry at all. Food appears everywhere. In shops, food in the hands of people, food in restaurants, food, food in homes, food everywhere. Quesi, quesi, chikafu. You just have to take. Hands reach out, torai, take, it's easy. Take the food. And the head will lift itself. The hungry man finds himself at the police station. And if you want to hear more about what the hungry man has to think, please buy the goddamn book. <laughs> Listen, people, listen, listen. What is going on in Zimbabwe now? Zimbabwe is open for business. Zimbabwe opens its legs and waits. Who will come? What will they do? What will they get out of it? What will they find in Zimbabwean soil? Diamonds, chrome, platinum. You have to get it out. You have to break down the mountains after all. A mountain is not a person. You have the right to crush the earth, to make her into nothing. You have to do it. So the people will not be able to see everything, so that they will not hear anything. We need people to stop climbing the holy mountains and seeing the way God sees. The people must move away from the stars and live without understanding, without knowing, without prospects. We need the earth to be flat, as people once believed the mountain should not inspire the people with its pride. We have to get rid of it. We do not understand this clustering of people around the mountain. The mountain is not a person after all. The mountain is a dead thing. There's no soul there, no spirit. Zimbabwe open for business. Come people, come to Zimbabwe. Here, you can buy lions to murder elephants for entertainment, mountains to blow up. 
Welcome to Zimbabwe. In the beginning, the storms and the people, they lived in peace. And the mountains picked up the people when they were lost and reoriented them in a good way. And the most sacred mountain was called Zimba Zimbabwe. And the people were at home there. One day, a man wandering found a shiny stone on the ground. There were many such shiny stones living in the ground. But now, something evil awoke in his heart. Something that loved the beauty of the stone and wanted it all for itself. And though the stone cried and cried, the man took the stone into his sweaty hand and he took it home. He did not listen to the cry of the stone. The stones, the stones, the stones evicted from their homes, the stones evicted from their homes. <clears throat> At home, his brother said, what is that you have there? And the man showed his brother the stone, and the brother said, I want one just like that. So they went back, the two of them, and then there were more of them that came. Everyone wanted a shiny stone. Everyone wanted a shiny stone only for themselves. And even though the stones cried, the people still took the stones into their sweaty hands and carried them home. And the mountain watched. And the mountain watched them. The mountain saw everything. The stones evicted from their homes. The stones evicted from their homes. The stones evicted from their homes. A human being is easy to manipulate, you understand. You do not need to cut off their head. Their head will bow down. It will touch the ground on its own. A human life falls easily. You do not have to shoot or indeed try it all. It's child's play. But the mountain is something else entirely. The head of a mountain, the head of a human being, will hang easily because of humiliation, sadness, illness, or hopelessness. The head of the mountain, however, never falls down. The mountain looks with clear eyes into the distance, into space, into heaven. It stands proudly and will stand like that for centuries. Even your great-grandfathers admired the mountain's beautiful and royal attitude. Even your grandmother's great-grandmother marveled at the mountain and her back straightened with her head lifted at the sight. 
Her eyes became clear and shining because this is what mountains do. The mountains make it so that people look up and look ahead with proud, bright eyes. They see into the future without fear, always and everywhere. The mountain lifts the human spirit yesterday, today, tomorrow. The mountain makes it so that people are never humiliated. We must cut off the mountain's head. They growl like that. Corporations, the minds, everything that holds a human being enslaved inside. We must cut off the mountain's head. Because the mountain cannot be humiliated, it is impossible to force the mountain to bow its head, to cast eyes down in shame, to grovel at a king's feet. The mountain will always look ahead proudly. It will never stop connecting the sky and the earth. This is the work of the mountain. That is why you have to cut off the mountains yet there is no other way. Only when we manage to humiliate people can we make them do everything just as we say. Only an earth without mountains will make the eyes of the people again and again be stuck on dirt. That is how such a person will drag themselves along. Hungry, sad, homeless, humiliated, ill. This kind of a person will not ask for money, for pay, for insurance, for rights, for a house, for a school, for their children, for food. This, will, this person will only take what they are given and nothing more. We must cut off the mountain's head. Thinking. I see hands shaking, like people sighing. I want to know. Do you want to share? Do you want to share your mountains? We are to believe that this is normal. This business of cutting off the mountain's head. We are to believe that this is a normal way of life. When a car hits you, your body shakes. When a fear hits you, your body shakes. When God hits you, your body shakes. The body shakes, the body can't stop shaking. Now the earth is shaking. At first it shook because people needed something, needed us. Maybe the Chinese or maybe it was the Americans slicing into the earth so they could find some stones or metals. Then the land started shaking on its own. Life looks like that. First, someone starts, then we cannot stop. We cannot stop. We take men teach them to shoot and kill and beat on orders. Then they come back home and they shoot and kill and beat, sometimes without a cause. We do not understand. We say, we've stopped ordering. We have exploded one mountain shore, but we left another one in peace. We have exploded a mountain. Why is the mountain's brother shaking? We have destroyed the house of stone. Why is my heart shaking?
Hello. Hey. Hey. Cool. Um, I'm just very fascinated um, by the relationship not only between us and our ancestors, but also our ancestors hearing us. I think another fascinating thing is the role of the observer within this. So someone who is watching at the ceremony and seeing what takes place. And I think I find myself in that role, especially reading, uh, listening to, to, to the readings. It was almost, um, sometimes we try and listen so hard to the ancestors that we forget to talk back. But sometimes, equally, it's rare to be in a space where people are talking amongst each other with ancestors and you're just there listening. So that feeling to me is really fascinating. also brings feelings of jealousy and envy and this feeling of I want to be head to this mountain. I think it's super interesting how pan vitalism can be used to almost give these um, natural beings life, um, which is something that we do but tend to disrespect. <laughs> yeah. But I'm curious if we could actually like have a one-to-one -one with our ancestors and be like, yo, this business of you just like deciding to manifest whenever you want, you know. <laughs> because they're all very dramatic. And like being able to level and be like, okay, fine. If we're going to dance together, if we're going to exist in the same space, can you at least give me this foresight to at least see, oh, yeah. there's a nice deal. Stay away from that. No, don't do that, you know. That kind of thing. Like. Just having a, a discussion and men to men with your ancestors. Mm. Oh, we, yeah. But how open are we to even having those discussions mm. with them? Yeah. Mm. Can I can I also go for it? Just to I, I completely agree. I think sometimes um, we find ourselves in a space where we are almost too evolved to understand our ancestors. And the way that maybe they address the problems we have is in a way that, because of our perception and whatever sensory things are making our reality, we can't seem to understand them. Um, so I think the idea of like stripping down the natural things is super cool because it just unclouds you. Um, which is why I'm a big fan of what I, of what I heard just now. Um, but I think, just to your question, I think sometimes we tend to think our ancestors give us these like amazing grander kind of calls when it may be something so simple probably too glad to see it at the time. I've been thinking about that I've been reflecting on that as well. Mm. So I can around that as well. Like you're just meant to be there to heal, to like listen. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. What about fighting? I feel like I just got Uh, I think uh, it's hard to have that conversation, um, the one that you were talking about, Shemaine, or that man-to-man, one-to-one. Um, particularly for us Zimbabweans, we have been taught or perhaps conditioned to believe that our ancestors are evil. Uh, imagine if this book launch was a, some religious thingy. Imagine <laughs> this room was going to be very small. But, you know what I mean, like people were going to flock, but the moment that you say we're doing ritual theatre or we're doing ceremony, theater, people are scared of it. There is a bit of, uh, you know what I mean, it's not really a commercial form. If you are not really convinced, or if you haven't had like a personal journey 
personal spiritual journey or if you don't really research, if you're not open enough, you don't want to go and watch a ritual theater or yeah. uh, Clara calls the, the ceremonial theater. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I'm curious though to hear what your experience has been, uh, Clara, in terms of the um, ceremonial theater as a viable. I don't know if viable is, is, is the right word, but like, it's a commercial how, thing. how commercial has it been in terms of, you know, like the audiences, in terms of making money out of it, how, how, how has it been? Yes. I understand, um, you know, like it's really about you know, playing to the, to the space and, the, you know, I mean, there's a bigger, uh, it's beyond us. Money in life, yes. <laughs> Yeah, but in terms of putting money in diapers. Once you're talking, can we pass this basket around for? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so we talk to my secretary. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll make a donation. Um. Yeah. So thank you for that question, and I also want to address uh, the comments earlier because I feel that, it, and part of the book does address actually both of those things. Um, we have. Uh, in trying to talk to our ancestors and trying to listen to our ancestors, we have lost the project of the great ancestors. You know? uh, and that I'm saying that in the sense that um, when we look at uh, the recent dead and the ancient ones and the relationship between the two, now I know that here very often those ideas are presented in the form of a hierarchy. I don't really connect with the idea of the hierarchy because automatically it puts um, it puts certain kinds of power dynamics that I don't think it's useful in terms of us thinking in that way. It's not about somebody having power over somebody. It's about um, everything having its place and that any kind of society that is run by ancestors who do not have guidance from the ancient ones we are all lost, you know? So in my experience, in my journey, one thing definitely that I feel that, uh, and I know that I'm speaking to this crowd, um, you know, in Zimbabwe, but I'm also recording and I'm hoping that people listen from outside of Zimbabwe. I feel that a, not, the question that is asked very often in the West that is not useful at all is, is are the spirits real? And we need to, um, we're wasting time with that question. The spirits are real. They're as real as we are. We're here, they're there. Now the question becomes, okay, how do we work together? Who are these spirits? Who are they listening to? What journeys have they undertaken? So to give you an example um, from my experience also, uh, uh, yeah, as a medium and, and as a shikiro, uh, I, I've been given a lot of visions about certain things. Um, so for example, if you have, if you have a, ancestors who are pretending that they've undergone the journey and it's because it's very easy for them to stick around certain ceremonies make it quite easy sometimes they're forced but sometimes they actually eh, they're just uncomfortable you know and so they haven't actually been sent back they're not carrying anything they are tied to their earthly experience still by certain forms of trauma they are real spirits by the way they will show up as real spirits. They will see real things. And then we human beings were like, wow, it's a real spirit and it's telling me real things. Yeah, but again, has it undergone the journey? Has it been sent back? Is it actually carrying the light of the other ones, the great ones or the ancient ones or the other, just the other ones, you know, the, um, the ones who are, a, you know, even sometimes whether it's more connected with the stars or more connected with, a, with certain parts of the earth or... It's a very complex reality. The spiritual reality is so complex. No, no human being is ever going to encompass all of it, understand all of it. So, so that, it, to me, um, is a big part also of, of, of the book, of listening to the stories and the messages of the, of the, the great ancestors. And the, the funny thing about them is usually their messages are quite simple. Um, you know, love one another. <laughs> Love the earth. Um, 
you know, kind of respect each other, respect nature, respect life, um, you know, respect death, because life comes from death, and uh, that cyclicality is important. It's very, very simple things that somehow we human beings are, of course, we're still learning, but that application, that sense of, um, you know, the kinds of drama that I'm talking about, when I talk about theater and so on, that isn't just drama that's put into us by human beings. That is also sometimes spiritual drama that we can even say, this is unnecessary, you know? Um, as for the question, it's a very good question, you know? And of course, I'm, I'm figuring it out. I'm on my way to be rich. <laughs> by my book, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, it's, uh, I feel, I used to feel maybe a little bit about my journey. Um, because a lot of my journey, uh, and the journey that's described in this book, has been the journey of an outcast. Uh, in many places, countries, societies, and then within my own body. Um, I, my illness, my kind of the shamanic illness and so on, it was, um, it was just bad. <laughs> it was very, 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 very bad. Um, physical pain is uh, probably more more known to me than um, feeling uh, at home in my body. So all of that. Is, so I remember during those times, you know, when even some of the stories that are come out of this book, it was a life of you know, yeah, I, I was under a tree. I was playing for the mountain. I had nowhere to go. I had nowhere to be, I had nowhere to live, I had, you know, it was, um, it was a very desperate existence on, on many levels, um, and, and I was led through that, you know, through all of these initiations, if you will, um, it, and I, I struggled because I would also tell, you know, my people, my, my spiritual family, um, just say, you know, look, you are telling me that I'm, like, how is this ever going to work among people? How do I return to the human community with this vision? In such a way that the human community will actually accept it, that it will become viable, as you say, or commercial, or that there will be you know, sustenance, that I will be able to survive. And then COVID happened, uh, and that's the introduction of the book. It opens with that story about COVID, because um, I was in Poland when COVID hit, um, I was I was in Warszawa, and I remember um, actually my first book, my first Polish book. Uh, the launch was the day before the the lockdown, um, so it was very interesting. Uh, yeah, it was it was great actually. You know, all the people who came and so on. It was really um, yeah, it was an amazing synchronicity. I found 2020 to be a huge ceremony for the Earth. You know, everyone in their own individual way, certain societies in big ways, but. Everyone went through something very important. Um, so during that time, there was a phenomenon, you know, Netflix was very popular. People were stuck in their homes in Europe. Um, and there was a Guardian article about these top movies that were being played on Netflix. Um, and the very top movies that were being played were uh, the Japanese animations of Miyazaki, which I don't know if you know um, the work of Miyazaki, Spirited Away, Princess Mononoke, these are beautiful stories about the beauty of life and the beauty of nature and the beauty of the human journey within relationship to nature, you know? Very much based on Japanese mythology, very much just sweet, just sweet. And I realized that because 2020 was probably the first year when I started to feel like a human being um, within my work and I started to, like, people actually started to appreciate what I do. Um, and that was a moment when I looked at that and I thought, wow, when the end of the world comes, people don't want all of these movies about shooting and war and bombs. When the end of the world is actually here, then we are watching Japanese animations that are telling us that life is sweet, you know? <laughs> and so I feel that, I, and I feel that since then, there's a sense that there is a change in the world. And of course, we are that change. We are that, you know, that motion towards um, the creation and the speaking out of something that 
all of us now. I mean, that's also why I wrote this book. Uh, there's a, the chapter at the end. How do we do this? How do we approach this work? How can how can you do it? How do we do it together? Um, how do we reorient our spirits? Uh, and you know, and the audience is gathering. And with the gathered audience, um, at some point, it becomes commercial. And until then, we're in survival survival mode. But we live in Zimbabwe, so what's new? <laughs> yeah. So that would be my uh, unfulfilling answer to that question. Yeah. When I get rich, I'll tell you. <laughs> Yeah, there was a the question. Oh, yes. it was answered. Yes. Ah, yes. Yes. <laughs> but another one is on the way. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Cool. Um, well, uh, I wanted to, to read uh, a fragment of the star ceremony. Oh, no, we're going to Nzad, sorry. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah Nzad, absolutely. Yeah, speaking of commercial. <laughs> a <laughs> um, couple of years ago, two, two, three years ago, I was privileged to be part of the, uh, when you invited me, Clara invited me to to have a look at um, the rehearsal, one of the rehearsal sessions for the play, uh, you know, to just give some insight and uh, as, 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 a, as a writer, and someone who is into performance art, and it was it was, a, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I I wish that all of you one day have a chance of watching this play. It's an amazing play. These people have gone far, too too far. Kure Kure, Johannesburg, Durban, Cape Town, London, America, Nigeria, Canada, China, Australia, Russia, Holland, Sweden, India, Mexico, Argentina, Egypt, Spain, Germany, Poland, their bodies return. Their spirits are lost. Mwea yakarasika. Empty shells return. Are they still people inside? Mukatikati me moyo. Wachirine moyo here. In the depths of their hearts, do they still have a heart? These people have gone everywhere. They are coming now. They are coming back to pray. They do not know how to pray anymore. They have gone too far. Their minds have gone scrambled. Their roots are ripped and tangled. What happened to them? Only the moon knows. came over COVID, um, when I say came again, it's from these relationships to, you know, of course, I, I suppose the, the nice word or the word that is mm -hmm. academically appropriate would be mythology. Um, mythology, you know, that whole thing, the idea that the things that are said mm, can mean one thing to people, another thing to the spirit, and another thing to initiated people, which is also a theme that we as humanity now are starting to um, 
it's almost like hatch out of because um, because our initiations are becoming more collective. There is a great awakening. I can feel it. Um, and I feel like many of you, if not all of you, also feel it on many levels. So it, so the star ceremony was, it, it was the stars, I mean, yeah, they started getting my attention mm, in very, very dramatic ways, which is usually what happens. Um, and it, it's a... Uh, it's a series of times. So the, the whole play is not actually in this book. It's a separate book on its own, but I included fragments of it. And also there is a, there is a, a Polish version of it that is, uh, it's untranslatable because it's in verse and it's, um, I guess you could say the same idea, but in a completely different language. And that idea that, uh, which I feel is really important for all of us, um, if you think about a shrine, and you think about a sacred place, it's a place that you go to, whether it's the shrine in your home, whether it's a nature shrine, whether it's, you know, in some other place. Um, and you go there, and you know when you are there, and then you leave. But what the stars teach us is that they build shrines out of time, out of times. And we are all swimming in times. And I do use the plural, because the stars also, they teach us about the multiplicity of times, all of the time, that we are experiencing. And that there's something very good and wholesome about that. Um, and that our civilization has, it, it's actually starved time. It's a cruel thing that we've done. It's not just about making it linear, it's also about starving it of its natural kind of layers and, and fat, you know, if you want to call it. Um, and what that's done is that we don't understand when our human life, our human existence has actually moved us through a shrine of a time. I don't know how else to put it. We don't know how to recognize it. We don't know how to honor it. We don't know how to be with it. We don't know how to experience it. And so the star ceremony was very much about healing time and our relationship to time. Um, and it was also about the human spirit itself. It was very much the, 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 the myth that it grew out of, was the myth of Isis and Osiris. Uh, and, uh, and also it inspired the Nyamatsatsi festival, which I will also talk about. Um, so I wanted to read one of the times um, that is included in this book. Um, Um, choice. Um, just randomly pick a number. Okay. Between what? Between what? Um, Something with a seven. Uh, okay, three between three seven three and. 400. 377. Oh, man. Never asked the people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I found it. Um, okay. Is it 377? It's actually not, it's 387. <laughs> Almost. Almost. And it wasn't given as an option. Yes. yes. Um, okay. The time of searching. Lurching humanoids seeking for the nurturing suckling of big mother cow haunting our own spirit. Isn't it the, uh, supposed to be the other way around? Not anymore, not in this strange time. Where is the spirit of the human? We need to tell his story. It's been too long. It's our story, isn't it? The story of how we got on our feet. The big spirit of the human, our ally, our soul. The stars are hungry for that story. They haven't heard it in a long time. They know the spirit of the human. They can return him to us. They can return to us his magical sister. 
The stars know where they are. They can point the way. They know all about calendars and maps. Really, when it comes to time and space, we should only ever ask them. They know about all of the times, all of the special times, the sad times and the mad times, and the joyful times and the great times, and they don't call them places, they call them times. There is a big difference, you see. The stars call everything a time because they can see everything is still being created and the borders between the innumerable living times, they don't really exist. The stars are wise. They keep all of the different calendars. That's why they, that, that's what they do. The universe is like a big room full of infinite numbers of calendars, and each calendar has its own special time, and all of these calendars are playing together like a symphony orchestra, beautiful music. It is like a round room full of many clocks that never show the same time, yet they are all correct simultaneously at the same time. Not one of them is wrong. They are just different but never wrong. Where is the spirit of the human? He knew these things. He told us how to keep the calendars. Yes, that's right. There was something like that. He taught us how to keep the many calendars all at once. Nothing standard, no, no standardizing, because they are all different the many times. His sister would knit and weave the calendars into cloths, she would tie the calendars inside of dolls. She would string the calendars as beads onto necklaces that women and men would wear. It wasn't just women who wore the calendars woven by the sister of the spirit of the human, the magical star sister. It was men who wore the calendars on their bodies, same as the women. The spirit of the human, he told us, you are all people. All of you are the people. He told us these things, the spirit of the human. He said, the body is the vehicle for the soul. What do you mean vehicle? Like transport, he tried to explain. The body is like the spaceship for the soul. You go inside and then you can travel anywhere you want. But these bodies are weak, we questioned. They get sick, they die. But the soul never dies. Mm, he told us that mysterious thing, remember? He said, when the soul comes to earth, it needs a material body so the soul can operate in this life. You would make a big mistake to look first on the body and not on the soul. He warned us, the spirit of the human did. You must look at the soul first and foremost. That will tell you who is sitting before you, who it is that you are speaking to. There are some people, they have souls from distant galaxies, and there are other people who have souls only from this galaxy. Some people have very young souls, souls that are fresh and innocent and curious like soft young oysters. And there are some people who have very old souls, souls that are hard and tough like wizened clams and as big as the universe in themselves. And there are some souls that when they come here, they are still in the form of an egg. They haven't hatched yet, even though they are attached to a body. There are some people who are unhatched souls, and yet they walk around attached to the world and they don't know how to see souls. Their soul hasn't hatched yet, so they don't even believe there is such a thing as a soul. But that's okay. It's all part of the plan. And yes, yes, there is a plan. It would be a big mistake, however, to take these people at their word. Their guardian angels are shaking their heads and rolling their eyes and sticking out their tongues and pulling their human forward on their energy leash like when a dog is sniffing a curb for too long on a tiresome walk under a hot sun at noon and they just won't give up sniffing and sniffing and sniffing that one boring spot. And so you pull them because you have to continue the walk so you can go home. That's the same way that their guardian angels are pulling their unhatched soul humans forward and rolling their eyes. There they go again. They don't know nothing yet. But now, in these strange and absurd times, we believe these people. We are fascinated by their unhatched nature. Their unhatched soul eggs have captivated us and we stare into them like television screens. The new cool is to imitate the unhatched soul people, to say what they say and do what they do, even when our souls cry, no, don't do that, listen to me. <laughs> we make the unhatched soul people our leaders, 
and we say, tell us more, 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 more. Tell us how to live like you who does not yet have a soul that has emerged from its sacred egg. We adore their unhatched soul idiocies, who knows why. And they stand on the podiums we build for them. And they scream, we are soulless, we are soulless. Everything around us is machine. And we are the soulless that live in the machine. Hooray, hurrah, that's us. Then they take pictures of themselves. They call those pictures selfies. We've seen them do it, it's true. They should call them soullessies, but they don't. They call them selfies. If they look very carefully at the picture, they can see the egg that is their unhatched soul that is attached to their body. We are waiting for their souls to hatch. Oh, it's taking a long time. Waiting is another kind of calendar. Where is the magical sister of the spirit of the human? She knew these things. Waiting is a whole other kind of calendar. There is a special place for waiting calendars. Each one is different, but they are all correct all of the time. All of the waiting times, they are correct, even if they are also demanding. The biggest waiting calendar is the one named Waiting for Prayers to be Answered. We are praying. We are waiting for their souls to hatch. When will it happen? We used to be able to ask our ancestors these questions. Where have they gone? Where have they run away to? Have they run from this war, or maybe something else chased them away? Thank you. Um, so the book is available for sale. Um, today it's still $25. After today it's $30. It's a different price on Amazon. I'm really not sure what it is on Amazon, but it's there. Um, but uh, yeah, it's part of that whole, you know, trying to sell things online thing. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, and I, I do want to talk a little bit about Mondoro Dreams and the Ceremony Theater and Yamatsatsi Festival, but uh, before I do that, that will be kind of the final thing. Um, I just, I do want to open again the floor if there are any other, any, any comments, questions, um, just anything at all, yeah, from anybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, the question that I have, or well, it's a comment actually, um, I just wanted to find out how you how you put together this book in terms of these are different plays and parts of your work that were done in different times, but the way you put them into the in this book, like the way you arranged them, it's like there's um, there's chronology and one thing weaves into the other. Like, uh, if you look at um, the story of the mountain, the way it connects with what's being said in Zara. Um, mm -hmm. Like, uh, the passages that she read, uh, and the passage that I read from the story of the mountain, uh, was talking about how people have lost their way, and you know, they're wandering and all that. And then we go to the part that I read from Zara, is talking about people are going everywhere, they just uh, all over the world, and what are they looking? What are they looking for? And then they come back as soulless. And even the part that you read it also touches on soulless people. And so this, 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 this uh, weaving of ideas mm -hmm. that uh, you know that's that's quite beautiful, like beautiful storytelling. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to know: did, was it intentional, or did you sit down with a team of? Uh, you know, <laughs> editors and say, okay, these are my stories, how can we put this, because I'm also into editing, uh, so it's, it's, it's fascinating, <laughs> it's fascinating to see how this, uh, you know, was put together. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you for that. Um, I mean, it was very intuitive, mm -hmm. it was very intuitive, it's really a journey of my own questions, um, and like you said, there's a chronology to it, um, it's a process, so I see my own kind of growth. Every, every ceremony um, in, in this book um, gave so much and took a lot um, and left me with new questions. So um, 
all of that, it's that, that on, on some level, it's it's a process of my own growth. So maybe that's why it, why it weaves so well. Yeah. Thank you. And and we need good editors. So yes, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I want to ask two questions. One is, you know, I was thrown out of academia a couple of years, so I don't know what's happening now. But, um, <laughs> but during my time, well, maybe except for for you know the found, one of those founding members of Zenata. I never heard of PhD candidates who were focusing on indigenous or native or animistic kind of um, you know, spiritual uh, <laughs> subjects, you know, that was, that was seen as something that doesn't belong to academia. Now I see you came from Yale, uh, there's another university. And now we're starting with you, Nisa. I'm wondering, can you attribute this to the progression of open thinking in academia mm, or aggression on the part of scholars like you? That's the first question. <laughs> the second question is <coughs> compatibility of ceremonies. You know, the Catholic ceremony and the Zezuru Shona Chirao ceremony uh, might not be that compatible, even though they might have similarities. Mm -hmm. um, how do you engage ceremony theater in communities where there are different mm -hmm. ceremony, ceremonial cultures or cultures of ceremony? Mm -hmm. Um, are you taking a universal kind of take at what is ceremony theater? Mm -hmm. Or can we be talking about ceremony theater? Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, that was a brilliant comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So before I before I go there, I also um, just want to acknowledge um, Eleni and uh, for letting us do this here at her amazing place, um, yeah, and just for being the most amazing space holder uh, of the last few years, in, mm -hmm, yeah, yes. in the country. So thank you so much. Um, yes. um, Academia, yes, I, I completely agree with you. When I finished my master's degree at Yale, I, I told myself, well, uh, okay, I told myself I would never do a PhD. But seeing as um, uh, I've been recovering for people, from people-pleasing since I was born, uh, I decided to ask my advisor whether he thinks I should do a PhD. <laughs> and um, he looked at me and he said, I mean, you're definitely good enough, you're brilliant enough, but I don't know if you have the right temperament. <laughs> so, um, so I thought that was a done deal and um, yeah, goodbye academia. Uh, I decided then that I was never going to undertake anything where I was not being, where I wasn't able to be honest. And that's what it felt to me like, it was just, mountains of lies. Um, people, uh, human beings uh, within that space, that was around 2012, 2013, nobody felt free to talk about their real lived experience, you know? Um, and actually if we look at that human experience also, of course now we have a different world, but at that point in time, um, I wasn't at liberty as a, whatever, as a scholar to say, um, yeah, when my brother died, um, he came back. Actually, he didn't even come back. Uh, he spent a long time working on things on Earth before he left, and then he came back. So it, it was a very unique experience. It was very normal. Within my family, even people who didn't believe, whatever you want to call it, they experienced my brother. He was the loudest dead person I know. Uh, <laughs> really. Um, why am I not allowed to talk about that? Why is that 
Why is my experience of being a human being somehow, oh, but it's unacademic or it's based on belief. It's not based on belief. I don't believe anything. I believe what I've experienced, you know? So um, now I am doing a PhD at the University of South Africa. Uh, the, the opportunity came up, but I'm writing it from the perspective of a Shikiro according to spiritual methodology uh, with a wonderful advisor, Nokutulak Lamangane, who is um, very supportive in this process because both she and I and many people, some of them who are here, are part of um, essentially a project of decolonization of the spirit, among other things. But it's something that a lot of us do take seriously, and uh, and there are more of us. I meet us all the time. So I feel like academia is changing. If I get my PhD, then it will be proof that it has changed, because despite being very aggressive, sometimes it, you, know, you also need other people to be on your side. Um, as for, uh, in terms of the compatibility of ceremonies, it's a very good question because ceremony and ritual is a tremendously wide subject. It's not narrow. Ceremony theater or the back and forth call and response storytelling and weaving uh, between the worlds is one form of ceremony. But it's certainly not the same kind of ritual that I would do if I calling, you know, protection around my house or whatever it is that I'm doing, uh, you know, or fixing things with my ancestors. Or, I mean, I mean, actually, that's not true because within ceremony, like I said, are layers of ritual. So a lot of rituals can be done within one ceremony also. Um, the thing to understand or the thing that I've come to understand is what we are talking about is we're talking about spiritual technology and we're talking about uh, spiritual... Um, language. So uh, I don't actually feel that ceremonies are incompatible with one another. I feel that where humanity is right now, even if you look at, I will call it a ceremony, the ceremony of COVID, um, from a spiritual perspective, um, human beings, when did human beings around the world all experience uh, it, it's not that we experienced the same thing, because obviously the realities were different. Lockdowns in certain places were very intense, lockdowns didn't exist in other places, but somehow COVID affected everyone. Um, it was in the news, it, was, it shut down communication between borders, countries. It was like a global ceremony um, of all of us experiencing something new in real time, together within this also technological world of media. Um, and that is also teaching us that the spirits are also evolving, they're also growing, they're pushing us to grow, they're trying to, to get us again to, to connect with one another and to understand that ceremony and custom, ceremony as spiritual communication and technology and custom are two different things, you know? Uh, we can respect both, but um, yeah, uh, obviously I'm not a traditionalist, uh, yeah, but uh, I'm a spiritual innovator, uh, just like all of my greatest teachers, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, my question was, um, you said the book's available on Amazon, is it going to be on Audible as well, like in this format, would be pretty cool. Oh, yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll think about it. Uh, I don't know how to do those things, but I'll figure it out. <laughs> the music, you know. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, definitely, there are parts of the place, especially the star ceremony. It is online on on my YouTube channel with the music, so being read and also along with the music. My YouTube channel is Clara Ana Rosa, yeah, with a K. Yeah. Yes. Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing? Great. Good. Good. Uh, I think everyone should buy this book and read it. It's really amazing. Um, and it is for me, reading parts of this book that were calling to me was essentially like a rememory. You know, like when you read a story and there's something so familiar, but that leaves you because life is life, you know, right? You've got things that you have to operate through in life. But I think for me, 
what Clara, you managed to do from a very deep spiritual um, place is the ability to see that essentially there is a part of me that is lost and that is trying to find its way. So through these stories, there is this awareness. And what that does, it sort of invites me to have a very intimate conversation with my ancestors where it's like, okay, if I'm living and moving around the world and I'm called to hug a tree, what does that mean? What, what's the story there? You see? So it, it sort of gave me my story. Yeah, and, and I think that people should actually... I'm interested in, in how, how we are all lost and how to find our way in the, in, in the relationship between um, spirit and our ability to listen to it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Well, if there are no further questions or yes, Alex. First of all, thank you. Everyone has asked questions as well. Um, one time, I used to be in rotations, but I felt like I was talking to ancestors was during a new boga ceremony, mm -hmm. and I guess I also think of dreams. What do you think about different states of consciousness and how they relate as far as communicating with ancestors, mm. past and future? Yeah, um, that's a beautiful question, and yeah, and we welcome the spirit of Iboga. Yeah, yeah. I know that spirit. <laughs> it's a powerful sekuru. <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, in terms of the difference, yeah, I mean. Uh, different states of consciousness on some level, they're all varieties of ways of waking up, aren't they? And varieties of ways of, of waking up into um, new levels of uh, understanding. And by levels, again, I'm not indicating hierarchy. It's more that universe full of many rooms that we uh, start to encompass bigger pictures of, of, of reality. Um, and... Uh, yeah, on, on some, in some way, all of us are called to that journey now. All of us are called to communicate. All of us are, you know, as opposed to, to, to the past, or maybe we can say the recent past, where uh, certain people were called to communication. And these days, it's, it's everyone who, who is being called to, yeah, to, that, to different forms of awakening. So, yes. On that topic, I was actually... Question I was contemplating if I should ask or not, but I'm glad it was brought up. Um, I take that as a sign to ask it. One of my biggest concerns of, not concerns, that wouldn't be correct because I shouldn't concern me, but observation is, but it does annoy me, um, is that spirituality now is coming with a price and is somewhat presented in a niche. So uh, Iboga ceremony, for example, isn't anything under $500, and that's like, if you know the facilitator. <laughs> like, oh, you can make it, like, if you send them WhatsApp messages. Um, so how is spirituality accessible? If you don't have the, fi and with financial, it's not only for me to pay the ceremony, but it's to be surrounded by like-minded people. Um, because it's not like you're going to hear a Reiki, Iboga, Ayahuasca discussion um, at your lunch break or in the queue, <laughs> in the bag for the queue, mm -hmm. or while you're paying your DSTV subscription. You know, it's not like my TT, but, but on, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I don't, as Eleni, I don't see spirituality accessible to all yet. Mm -hmm. One, um, how do we do indeed make it accessible? Mm -hmm. Then this might sound as a tricky and racist observation, but for example, now that spirituality is trending, if we are going to be talking about local sangomas, uh, a sangoma mm -hmm. word mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. they don't have don't a payment. <laughs> well, up to now, there was no payment considered. It's about a donation, an offering that you do. It doesn't have a price. Mm -hmm. um, the moment it's, I'm sorry, I'm pardon my English, it's not my first language, it starts trending. Mm -hmm. The price, really, 
it becomes a thing of price. And I do understand that there must be a value, and you shouldn't be. Don't get me wrong, but I'm I'm worried about the consumerism and the capitalism aspect Absolutely. that comes with the spirituality, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden, uh, I've got a thousand bucks to do a burger. Oh, now I'm centered and I found my ancestors. They, but you haven't done my burger, so you don't know. Hmm. What spirit is this? <laughs> <laughs> Your spirit is really weird. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I don't know. I'm very confused. I'm very skeptical. Yes. About how all this is. Going. I appreciate it because mm -hmm. it's brought to the open and discussions are held, cross racial, cross age. You know, throughout the world. Mm -hmm. I'm like, How do you guide your way purely, maybe through this? This is my big question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, it's an it's an excellent question. It's, uh, you raise really, really good points that I. Think. There, there was a hand over there. Oh yes, yes. He wants to jump right in. Um, that answer from the the reading. Yeah, well, whatever you want. I found it quite interesting. Like the story of the ink. You know, some souls are like, it becomes that, right? Where the masses actually take it up and follow from that perspective that they believe so, as opposed to the souls that should know because they already have grown. You know. Just don't. I hear, yeah. That it really just hit me. Yeah. Yeah. I love. No, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, you raised a really, really amazing point. <laughs> And I feel that, um, of course, it's, it's, a, it's a glib way of trying to understand a very complex reality because what you're talking about is very, very, very real, you know? Who has access to these things and also which things become big and popular and so on. I tend to um, look at these things uh, both from a human and then also from the spiritual perspective, you know? So, for example, with the master teachers, Iboga and Ayahuasca, who uh, are making global journeys at the moment. Um, from a human perspective, that looks like so. From the perspective of those spirits, what is their project? Why are they traveling? Why have they undertaken their journeys to say, despite everything, we are on this mission to wake human beings up? And I say that because I did study as an Ayahuasquera for quite a long time. Um, and I have great and deep respect for that plant. And one of the interesting things, uh, when you look at, uh, it's not just about commercial, it's also about the ways in which, for example, within the Amazon, um, certain groups of people, like the Shipibo, for example, for, for a long time in the recent past, women were not allowed to drink. Uh, and I find that very Ayahuasca. interesting. Uh, the medicine. Ayahuasca know. is a grandmother medicine. You know? But the woman went allowed to take it, is what you said. Yes, I and so and the grandmother. Yeah, so the this thing of like because the, the medicine expressed many times, at least to me, um, the sense first of all that it's her decision to travel. How human beings organize her travels is the business of human beings, is the business of that so process of waking up. Mm -hmm. Um and then the other thing of like I want to talk to the women, uh, I want to talk to the female spirit that is also within men, uh, but also in the women. And then how do I do that? Um, it's like I've been captured, you know, it's like I've been um, cloistered and I also am trying to break out of that, you know. Um, with when we consider that, when we realize, and plant medicine people, I'm not just talking about master plants, but any plants, because every single plant is psychedelic. Every single plant has a powerful spirit. Some of them are more kind of um, compassionate towards human beings. Some of them are less compassionate. Some of them just like to play with human consciousness. Um, yeah, and you can go crazy, you know, and you can. And the, and the plant is having a good time. The plant is like, oh wow, that was very entertaining. I'm going to move on to the next human foolish enough to, you know, eat me. Kind of thing. <laughs> so, from that perspective, 
there we are we are another species that is like and, and we're very young and we're learning and we're trying to you know make that effort and you will hear um, so the question how do we as humans organize that and then the other thing is uh, spirituality is a human right it doesn't mean that everyone is going to have access to a luxury retreat in Costa Rica you know, for two weeks or whatever. But spirituality itself, the connection to the spirit, is a human right, and it will find you if you, yeah, if, yeah. You, if you ask. Yeah, so, I don't know. A very deep question, thank you. Any, yes? No, 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 we, we, mine is longer, so Go first. I'm looking for time. <laughs> but I guess, uh, Eleni, it, it depends on the, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a longer conversation, mm -hmm. but it depends on the, uh, how you look at spirituality, like maybe when you look at, for example, in the Shona culture or in the Sesuru culture, uh, that it's, it's, it's really about family and, and the bloodline. So, yes, all these things can come, you can have the Sawiras, whatever, people will make you pay, or profits and stuff like that. But essentially, uh, your DNA is your, is your spirit. Even when whoever the ancestors, for example, if you are of the Mofu totem, the Eland, there is no way that you are going to get quote and quote blessings from someone who is of the Shumba totem because you know they, they don't they have no business with you. There's Shumba no... should be eating you actually. Yeah <laughs> yes, exactly. Nice. But why are you being nice? You know, you know what I mean? So but it's also but it's also that um uh I would say maybe colonialism and other religions that came did us like a, a big number that we we don't want to have that relationship with our you know like we don't want if you ask any average person or even portrayed demonic, right? yeah it's portrayed as demonic or even like in this room if we ask people to to name their family tree you you would go to maybe just your grandfather you don't even know beyond so even for if you if you are aware that those are your guiding people, those are the people that you're supposed to connect with, right? In whatever thing that you do, but you can't even name them. You don't even know their names. Mm -hmm. You don't even know how they were living. It's not really about going in the past, but because they are about even like the concept of totems, that uh, your totem is your that's your DNA. Mm -hmm. But you see someone say, yeah, I want to go to that retreat, be in my spirit, but they don't want to acknowledge or they don't want to be identified by their totem. So, yeah. People are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there are two quick questions. One is about the lady in front of me mm -hmm. appears to be witnessing this conversation. I think you brought her deliberately and placed her there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How does this woman understand the oh, role oh, in the ceremony? Talking about it's uh, spooky. <laughs> so that's the first question. Um, what's the role in this ceremony? Not that I know. I'm going to run in there. I'm going to run in there. It's actually a camera. <laughs> the second question uh, relates to you mentioned about rituals not being ceremonies and sometimes rituals encompassing ceremonies. You talked about the Shona spirituality being rooted in the concept of family. And I'm trying to link this up with the conversation that, that people had here yesterday about, you know what's personal, what's for sharing, what, what ought to be public and what is sacred. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted you to touch on that, starting with the lady. <laughs> <laughs> so the lady is Mokosha. Okay. Mokosha. 
Uh, she is uh, uh, she's our in the Slavic territories. Mokor, Mokosha, Mokos is what we call our goddess of the earth. You know? So she's a very, very powerful, the goddess of life, the goddess of love, the goddess of water. Um, Mokos, Mokor literally means the wet one. Mm. Yeah. So <laughs> you said the white one. The, the wet, 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 wet one. Wet one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wet white one. <laughs> the wet one. Um, she's the, the ruler of the waters in many ways, and uh, and she makes everything flower and blossom. And uh, and I bring her also because, um, well, uh, she's because of the tradition that we have in in the Slavic um, culture of doll making. So we do, we are ritual doll makers. Um, our dolls, this is, this is true globally, yeah? which is, I always find it very interesting when people point to dolls, uh, like uh, if you go to some museums and so on, I don't know, they have like ancient Egyptian dolls. They're like, ah, yeah, you know, so these children played with these dolls. And so on. I'm thinking in my culture, we make dolls as talismans. We make them as protection, we make them as uh, we make dolls for journeys, we make dolls, and, and there's a special way in which the dolls are woven. Um, so it's, it's a very powerful tradition, it's a very beautiful tradition. Uh, when I'm in Poland, I, got, I get together with my friends, we make dolls, we do the ritual of, of doll making. Um, which is, I didn't make this doll, my dolls don't look this good. <laughs> um, and also, it, but I did bring her as, um, as, as a life giver, yeah, as a life giver. Yeah, as Ooh, an all of the, the show name is like she makes dolls. <laughs> you know, a different name for those. <laughs> yeah, Hopefully, I mean. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's that thing of, because it's a global thing of, you know, that's why that whole interpretation, or even if I see in a book that, you see, oh, it's, these are dolls, so these were initiation dolls that were supposed to show people, you know, I don't know, like, maturity, or they were used for mm. sexual initiation, or so on. I'm thinking, no, that's not true. But I know that from the perspective of the spirituality of my culture. And again, it's only when we acknowledge that spirituality of all of our cultures that the true story, even of our history, begins to emerge. And see what resonates with your soul. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know? So so that, that brings me to um, to the, the part about uh, yeah, so so uh, I'm the director of the Nyamatsati Festival. Uh, we've uh, we are we are doing our third edition this year. Um, in August. It's August fourth uh, through the eleventh. It will be in Harare and Mashingo. Um, and uh, this year's theme, which I'm announcing uh, for the first time today, uh, is um, Africa's spiritual history. Um, so that is our theme this year. Uh, we, we are really excited about it. Um, next week, on February 1st, we are doing a, a ceremony of fire and water, uh, or Birane Mvurane Moto, Ceremonia Vode Ognia, um, whatever you want to call it, we are doing it here. So thank you so much again um, to the Katikitiki stage in the garden and Eleni uh, for, for, for opening up the space. And we will be, uh, among other things, there will be music, there will be dance, Carmen will be there as well. Um, and uh, we are also going to be showing the uh, introductory video of Nyan 2024 because we have a headliner ceremony theater play um, that uh, we are also going to be holding auditions for through the Mondoro Dream Ceremony Theater uh, in February. So uh, please do um, kind of show up, follow, like, send to, to people who would be interested as well. Um, and uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm really excited about all of that. Um, I feel that in my life, at least, um, the call has always been to follow my dreams, um, possibly especially in those moments when they seem the most illogical. Uh, and to, to, to establish a ceremony theater has been a, a dream for a long time uh, for me. So I'm, I'm really happy to be finally this year, um, maybe, I mean, I've been doing it for years, but maybe going about it slightly more confidently, um, slightly more formally, and um, slightly more, well, definitely, uh, a lot more unapologetic about the spirituality of it. Because that's the part that, um, if that's not your thing, 
don't come to my don't come to my theater <laughs> because because the kinds of stories and mythologies that we are all moving into globally require us to gain certain kinds of spiritual awareness and the kinds of stories and ceremonies even in this book um, require spiritual preparation and initiation for people to be able to play the part um, speak the words and uh, and have it be respected just as much in the spirit world as as in this world so um, so so yeah so so that was pretty much what I wanted to say yeah um, thank you so much for coming um, thank you so much for this discussion we can continue this discussion um, you know I'm Maybe here sorry I just said with the sticker. Oh, with the, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah, and the book is is on sale. Um, so, like I said, it's still twenty five dollars today. Um, tomorrow it will be thirty dollars here, and then on Amazon. Yeah, I'm just not sure. I have to check. <laughs> um, yes, and thank you so much to the to the readers. Um, yeah, and for, for blessing. This place with your <laughs> Is the book going to be available in the book fantastic shelves behind us? Uh, I hope so, yes. Oh, okay. thank yes, you. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.